You know, the title of the presentation was Fostering Music Creation, Responding to the Desires of the 21st Century Learner to Create Their Own Content. So I'll repeat that. Fostering Music Creation, <laughs> uh, Responding to the Desires of the 21st Century Learner to Create Their Own Content. And there's real specificity in those words in terms of music creation and content. Um, so let's kind of lay the groundwork for a little bit, like what what's the landscape and it, it it starts with i'll read a quote from uh, uh, a tatiana sirisano of a company called uh, medea research and her quote is i think we're getting to a place where younger generations expect to be able to participate in the content that they are fans of rather than just kind of passively consume it to participate in the content rather than just consume it and uh, there's an enormous amount of data that, that supports that large macro trend. So if you think about what that means, music making and a variety of other arts have been on this large trajectory. Previous to audio recording, music was largely by definition very participatory. Um, the, and that ran the gamut. And that would include like the Italian arias where the audience is hooting and hollering, the singers trying to sing, the orchestra's playing. It's, it's like a kind of a bit of a chaos madhouse until the orchestra and the singer hits upon a piece that an audience says, yeah, we like that one. Then they'll get, they would get quiet and the orchestra and the singer would go back and play that piece starting from the beginning of it in its entirety, participatory. The recording industry came and if you think these as, as overlapping concentric bubbles, the audience and the creator, the performer, the, uh, the recording industry comes and it separates that. There's a clear distinction. The performer is the performer. They're the gifted ones. They're the one on the stage. You're the one in the audience quietly taking that in. You're the one uh, that's buying their uh, commodity of music making, the record. Um, and that we've had that for, depending on how you count, 100 plus or so years, a little over 100 years, about say 110, 115 years of of that. Well, now you come to our era and there's been this incredible movement into social media, which has kind of become the, the catch-all of all artistic expression. And the idea that it came with that sort of movement and, and our cell phones, our smartphones and all of that is, well, we're all content creators. That has become a normalized idea. So there's some really interesting statistics that, that support this. One that's really striking to me is a higher visibility survey found that one in four Gen Zers, and this would be true for Gen Alpha, which comes after, uh, plans to have a social media influencer career, 25%. That means a career of being a content creator, 25%. Uh, and according to Forbes, that's replaced what used to be top answers of being an athlete and a musician being a content creator is the driving force. Um, so if you have, by some estimates, 730 million musicians globally, it's an estimate, of course, you have about 207 million content creators globally. Literally a third. <laughs> um, so this movement back from uh, consumptive to participative, this movement from being a, con a, a, a consumer where I just listen to music to being somebody who's naturally I engage in the creation of that. And we've seen that happen in other sort of forms. We've seen that happen in photography where it used to be a very high technological li a lift and feat. You had to go to a specialist. Now we all take our, our photos on our phones and we don't, some, some uh, like yourself, are professionals. <laughs> Some are not. Um, video is the same. You know, I might not define myself as a Steven Spielberg or even as a filmmaker, but I've shot tons of videos and I've put, uploaded that in the venue of Instagram and Facebook. Um, so these smartphones that we're walking around with are essentially little portable multimedia recording studios. Music, because of the, the learning curve, has lagged behind in that a little bit. 
It's a little bit more complex. It's not, it hasn't been quite as ubiquitous as photography and video, but those days are, are, uh, are ending. Music is fast becoming the music creation tools that are on the market, and especially with coming AI, are making the ability to create music as ubiquitous as film and video. So this normalized idea of I create content is something that's really interesting that it's, it's, it's prevalent in high percentage in the learners of the 21st century. And that's not just youth, you know. It's not just young people that um, shoot video. So that's something that, you know, the, the question for us at McPhail has been, well, what does that mean for us? We're a music institution. What does that mean for teaching music? Um, and that's what I was hoping to kind of get at. Like the traditional ways that music creation has showed up in the, uh, the academy, the music institutions, has been in two streams, either as improviser and as as, or as composer. Improvisation, composition. Um, improvisation has long been taught largely under the auspices of jazz. Composition has lo long been taught in, under different sort of traditions. Um, so one of the problems, though, with that is improvisation has been so linked to jazz Whereas improvisation is so beyond jazz. Bach was an improviser. Uh, Franz Liszt was an improviser. Mozart was an improviser. Not just Charlie Parker and Duke Ellington and Miles Davis. But then again, Jimi Hendrix is an improviser. U2 improvises. The Edge improvises. So um, it's one of the reasons that teaching improvisation in the academy has had a slow grind is because it's been so linked and become so synonymous with jazz, and that doesn't fit everybody. It's like, I might want to be an improviser, but that doesn't mean I want to be a bebop Charlie Parker improviser. So that's, so something that, you know, I've always thought about is, well, how does the impulse to create music, how else does that show up in a lesson, private lesson or ensemble? And there's a couple of ways that I've seen it show up that I thought are really interesting as somebody who's taught improvis improvisation and jazz for many years. And one is the, what I call the explorer, the noodler, the play arounder. That's those uh, folks that like, come into a lesson and will go to their instrument. It's, they're making sound, they're creating sound. It's not the repertoire you're gonna get into. It's, either not, it's not a scale, it's not an exercise, it's not an etude, it's not the repertoire that you're learning. It's something else entirely. Um, and then quite often the teacher's like, okay, okay, let's stop that and let's get to our work for today. <laughs> and we move back to the real music, you know, what you're supposed to be doing. Um, that's one. The other is what I call the transcriber, the person who's doing the same thing either before a lesson, after a lesson, they're playing something else. But this time it's not really noodling and playing around. It might be something that's in their ear, the song they heard, a song that they might want to learn, something that they're curious about. In this day and age, it could be a, uh, a video game theme song or something. I hear that quite a bit. Some song out there that they want to learn. The, the, if improviser and composer is the, the academic term, I might say transcriber is when you go and transcribe that music. You learn it by ear. Um, but that's another form of it. And then the other form, to me, facilitated by technology, I might call the producer or the curator, the sampler even. That's the folks that create the DJs and the playlists. You know, oh man, check it. Or mixtape back in the day. <laughs> you know, but oh, I got a great mixtape. So I'm curating a collection of music and I'm thinking about, I'm not, I might not be creating individual pieces in that, but I'm creating a new path, a new trajectory through that music. And there's others, but What's so striking is so often those forms will exist so often in the margins, either the beginning of a, a lesson or an ensemble, a class, or after. And it's something that I've always thought about. Why then? Especially in a, in a group, a big band rehearsal is about to play. Everyone's getting the horns out. They're getting warmed up. It's all the cacophony, all that chaos. You listen to what people are, or like when the orchestra's, and you're hearing all this chaos. With a professional orchestra, often you're hearing things that they're going to 
play or want to work on a passage, and it gets lost in all that kind of mix and that cacophony. But a lot, a lot of times in, uh, with younger folks in small groups and bands, you can stop the band and go to the bass. What were you just playing there? Oh, I was, just, I was just messing around. I don't know. I was just kind of doing something. Part of the reason that they're inclined to do that in the group is all that cacophony provides cover. It's not just exposed. If there's 20 sound sources in the room, I can work on my little sound source, this little thing I'm curious about, small little musical cell, a melody, a phrase, a beat, a groove. I can work on this, or I can introduce this to the room and see who picks it up, see if someone responds without drawing too much attention to myself. It's one of the reasons why it happens in the margins uh, in, a, in a group or a class. And same thing with a, uh, with a private lesson. Um, I'm going to kind of play this before the teacher's really dialed in. <laughs> teachers might be getting their coffee or they're getting their, or getting, saying goodbye to the next lesson, next, the previous student, whatever it might be. They're, I don't, they're not fully engaged yet in the margins. So, you know, that uh, form of expression is something that if you're paying attention to it can be really relatively consistent. You'll see it again and again and again. So to me, that suggests that it, there's, there's meaning to it. There's a purpose to it. There's a methodology to it. Like, well, what's going on here? So for, the, for all of them, really, the noodler, the play arounder, the explorer, the transcriber, one of the things that I uh, uh, argue is, A, it's a form of communication. It's a way of saying to the teacher, this thing that I'm noodling at, that I'm doing right now, matters to me. It's a part of my musical identity. It's something of interest to me. I'm, I, don't, I might not have the language tools or the wherewithal to bring that to you directly. Say, hey teacher, I'm kind of, I like just sitting around and playing things that, I don't, that probably are silly, I don't know. I'm not so sure about them. Um, I'm maybe a little embarrassed because I don't know what I'm doing, but it's kind of fun. I don't know how to talk about it. I don't really have words to put to it because I don't understand. It's not anything you're giving me, so I'm not sure if it's a good idea or not. Um, but I would like to show it to you, and I'd like to do it in this kind of safe way that doesn't draw too much. They're not going to do that. <laughs> but when they just sit and play that, part of what they're checking is, are you listening to me? Are you able to tune in to something that's of importance to me? So A, it's a form of communication that says there's something uh, really fundamental about this part of my musical interest. And I want to bring it into this context that is our lesson. And this is my method of doing that. So I'm communicating to that. So in my view, it's really incumbent upon the teacher to be able to hear that, receive that, listen to that form of communication. The student is not just doing that as a uh, just off the cuff. And they're not wasting time. They're really communicating that this matters to me. Um, and the other thing about it is, if it's the noodler and the play arounder, it's, it literally is, as someone who's taught improvisation for many years, it's the beginning building blocks, early stages of improvising. That student is literally practicing the skill set of improvising, which is hearing something being able to get in touch with something, how you, some, some way of connecting with something that you're hearing, and then finding the way to express that on your instrument. What is that? So I have to be able to hear it. I have to be able to process that. I have to make some sense of it. Does the, is it a melody? Does it go up? Does it go down? Does it go up by big steps or small steps? Well, let's find out what that is. So there's like kind of a chain of skills involved in that to be an improviser that goes hearing some form of analysis, I understand what I'm hearing, maybe some sort of theoretical underpinning, some sort of uh, technique. Um, okay, I think I hear what I'm doing. How do I now play this on my instrument? Um, you can kind of break that down into a series of interconnected uh, skill sets that the improviser has to make smooth and seamless a chain of skills that starts with the very thing you're often seeing that young person doing when they're noodling in your lesson. 
So it's literally practicing a form of improvisation. And they're bringing this to you in terms of the lesson. And then what is also inherent in that process is its uh, oral skill development. So it's not just a, um, it's not just I'm practicing improvisation. It's not that I'm just practicing music creation. I'm actually engaging in a fundamental aspect of ear training. Aural skills, which is always a lift. It's always a challenge for the teacher. How am I going to teach aural skills? In many ways, our students can teach us, show us how they best do that. And it shows up in this space. I guess there's a couple of things that that really then leads to. Uh, largely, I was trying to get at it anacrusis, is that the, the ed music educator, the teacher, all music lives within communities. All music, whether it's the orchestral classical community, it's gospel, hip-hop, funk, R&B, rock and roll, and sub-communities within that. All music lives in the communities. And two things that all communities share, 100% of the time, is the role of some teacher slash mentor. Um, if it's the church, it might be the choir director. Um, if it's a hip-hop, a community, it might be the producer at that hip-hop studio that's making the beats. Someone who's showing and mentoring others how to do this skill. Um, there's also always a hero, whether it's Jay-Z or you name it. You know, there's always like your influencer and there's always your teacher. And given the role of the teacher, that all music communities have this teacher mentor, I think there's just a real opportunity for that person to engage with that student in this collaborative act of music creation. And so many teachers I've seen over, over many years and I've talked to them about this will say, well, I'm not an improviser. I don't know that skill set. I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, Fair enough, but there's some early steps that you can do before. And that's what I was also really trying to get at. Many teachers, in, in a, lot of a lot of ways, are already engaging in this type of activity, but they just don't define it as such. Um, the number one thing for me would be ask questions. That simple act of, what are you playing right now? I've talked to countless teachers that have said, no, no, I'm, for example, I'm a classical musician. I know nothing about this. I said, have you ever had a student come in and just start noodling? Oh, yeah, almost every week. I said, what do you do when that happens? They go, I usually ask them what they're playing. <laughs> You're doing it. You've started. Um, when you push into that a little bit further, they'll tend to say something like, well, I'm just being nice or trying to build a rapport with the student. Um, I don't necessarily see it as part of my pedag pedagogical journey and vision for that student. Um, so what I'm arguing is you can, and you've already opened the door by asking them, what are you playing? And I've had so many teachers say that they've had incredible uh, experiences with their students simply by proactively doing that. But partly because what that does for the student and says, I'm being heard. Ah, oh, you asked. My form of communication was received. What I'm doing is, I don't know what I'm doing. They might say something like that, oh, okay. Great. But what, how, how did you come to play that? And you can start in a conversation on it. So the dialogue, um, that's where it starts, asking, what are you playing right now? They might say, it's a video game. It's my video game song that they, comes that I love. You know, they'll have a whole host of things. Um, so I think a teacher can ask questions. I think a teacher can um, ask to be taught. Can you sh show me that? Can you teach me what you're playing? It's a great, 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 great pedagogical tool because what it does is it, it then takes that student and forces them to be a little bit uh, critical in their thinking of what they're doing. Well, how would I articulate what I'm doing? How would I show another person what I'm doing? Where would I start? How would I go about that process? So it becomes a way of bringing it, their attention to their process and height, heightening that attention, that focus for them to think about, yeah, what am I doing? How would I, how would I share this with another person? What, of what I'm doing right now, what would I share? 
Would I, I say, well, I don't know what I'm doing? Would, we, would I say, just jump in? Like, how would I engage in that process? So asking to be taught is another, could be an incredibly valuable tool. Jamming along is a great one, where if you feel you have that skill, it's like, well, let me play with you. You're playing something that sounds cool. I like it. It's interesting. I can do something along these lines, and let's just keep going. Maybe it becomes a call and response. Um, but that becomes a really valuable tool. And then I always, because I'm the tech guy with Emra, I'm always on, well, you can record it, which is partly archiving it. You know what? Let me pull out my phone. Let me just record what you're doing. I'll, I'll send it to you as a voice memo or send it to your mom or your dad as a voice memo just so you have it. That's hugely valuable because then what it does is it allows a student to solely step over into the role of being the listener then. They're not so concerned about what I'm playing. Now like, okay, it's been recorded, now let me listen to it. And when you're listening to something without being tasked with having to generate sound, you will quite often hear things that you didn't know were there. Oh, I'm kind of missing that little note that I think. Oh, I'm playing this a little faster than I thought I was. Because you can just be totally objective, you're just now listening to it. Um, and it becomes a way of archiving and documenting what um, that student is doing. You've, you spend four weeks making this an agenda topic where you ask questions, you ask to be taught, you jam along, and you record. You will have a weekly agenda topic that will be so rich. You will have been so proactively engaged, literally in the act of music creation, that all those seeds of what improvisation and composition are you're really, really laying the groundwork for that. And many teachers have that capability already right within their toolkit right now, right within their skill set. It's largely just a switch in perspective, like a, a, just a different way of seeing this. Um, it's part of the reason I like uh, the idea of music creation as opposed to improvisation is the, the connotation of improvisation and composition can be weighty. If I have to improvise a, a magical passage Whew, okay, if I have to compose some incredible suite, okay, but if I'm just sitting around tinkering, <laughs> messing around with something, it's not that much pressure. Um, I can just noodle? You mean I can actually do that? Yes, you can. Okay, I can just play around with something? It doesn't have to become anything else? Yeah, unless it wants to. I can just explore how things sound? Yeah, yes, you actually can. So it kind of opens the, the, the creative door, so to speak. To me, the, the bottom line is it really enhances student engagement, for starters. Teachers that can bring this aspect into their, uh, their classroom, their ensemble, their private lessons, will, will see a marketed uh, uh, improvement, typically, in student engagement. Um, because it speaks to the, the whys of most students are there. Like there's very few students that would say something like, yeah, I want to go take piano lessons or guitar lessons because the only thing I want to be able to play is what my teacher tells me I have to play. I want to be able to just make music. I want to be able to play all kinds of things. I want to be able to play things that are fun to me. I don't know what that road is because I don't know what the skill set is to get there. Um, it speaks to the why they're there in the first place, for, for starters. So engagement, then engagement leads to better retention. Um, they tend to stick around longer because it's a lot more fun. <clears throat> it's a lot more comprehensive and complete uh, pedagogical journey that they're on. Um, but a big one also would be oral skills. It really becomes a great, fun way to develop the student's ear, ear training, oral skills. Um, when it's linked to playing and creating their own music. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, I would highlight is that, you know, I, I use the word identity, but, you know, I might even use the term identity affirmation in the sense that um, it's, as I said, if this is a form of communication, part of what the student is saying is, these little things I'm playing are part of my musical identity. And I would like for them to be a part of what we're, we're studying. I'm actually tentatively showing you this 
maybe more uncertain part of my actual identity. Um, and it also speaks to uh, the idea of, of cultural uh, resonance and relevance in that there's a lot of musical traditions that are not repertoire and notation based, that they're purely by ear. Western music has a heavy emphasis on notation, obviously. Classical, even jazz at this, in this day and age. Learning to read. So if you're going to play a song, well, wh you know, wh what's the music? Where's, what, do I get sheet music? What do I play? But there's whole other traditions that don't write anything down. It's all by ear. And that's how it's shared, that's how it's passed, that's how you learn. It would be um, antithetical to those traditions to come in and say, well, here's, I'm going to write this out. Here's a transcription of this African drum pattern. Why am I reading this? What, what does that have to do? So it, it, if, it, if you can facilitate this toolkit, the skill in the student, it opens up their capacity to play in musical traditions that are outside of the Western classical tradition. And it just builds student-teacher report. It just says, hey, you know, we're, we can be a team in this. There's, you know, if I'm going to ask you to show me something, that's flipping the script a little bit. That's saying, you know, there's, I'm curious about what you're doing. And then that helps them be, okay, then I can be curious about what you're showing me, that the flow of information is going both ways a bit. Um, and then my biggest argument is it's fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun to just start playing around and tinkering and be able to push into the idea of creating your own music.